Lovely. Thank you very much, Josie. Yes, I'm going to be talking about um, process developed at Nicolite. So I think this is the slide that you didn't see, just a brief introduction to, to who we are. Um, so I won't read all of this again, but uh, effectively we, we're a, a bunch of scientists who have developed this technique and we're now making it available through our range of equipment um, and the projects that we're undertaking. So we have been uh, involved in several research projects using our technology, and that's what I will be talking about today. So. Hopefully you can see um, the rest of these slides. Okay, so moving on to the actual talk outline. So I'll start off by talking about methods of synthesizing nanoparticles, or I think actually um, in the chemistry field, it's often, they're often called clusters. Um, so I'll talk about the different uh, techniques that are, that are employed, um, and then specifically focus on gas-based synthesis. So the technique that we use, why that, how that works, why that's different. Um, and the properties of the materials generated using te that technique, because that's important for the applications later that I'll talk about the case studies using for, for electrocatalysts. Uh, I'll then introduce the equipment that, are, uh, that we've used for the projects. So we've set a range of different um, equipment, but I'll be focusing really only on one particular instrument, which is particularly well suited to this um, type of work, um, developing um, catalysts. So I'll explain a bit more about what the, the features of that um, equipment are and how it was used um, in the in the projects. And then I'll move on to, to two case studies, both of which are, are projects to develop electrocatalysts for, for, for water splitting for green hydrogen. The first one is a high entropy alloy nanoparticle catalyst, and the second one is a, a nickel iron oxide catalyst. Um, slightly different uh, projects and, and different results, but um, a similar motivation behind uh, each project. Okay, so um, let's move on. So methods of man manufacturing nanomaterials. So there are a range of different physical and chemical techniques for, for generating uh, nanomaterials. Um, um, milling of uh, powders is quite uh, quite common. Um, it's quite easy to scale up. Um, it's a mechanical process wh whereby um, you can get a broad distribution of nanoparticle sizes, but it does give pretty poor control. And for, certainly for, for catalysis, where size is really important, and we're looking at the, the smaller end of that range of 10 to 1,000 nanometers, it's not really, really suitable. Uh, lithography is another technique which is commonly employed, not so much in catalysis, but certainly in our other application areas, such as surface enhanced Raman and, and uh, photonics. Um, lithography is used a lot to, to generate um, 2D structures and nanostructures on surfaces and does afford a, a great amount of control and repeatability of those structures, but is, is you know, complex and expensive, so it tends not to be used um, in scale up of, 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 of processes. Um, such as um, generation of, uh, of catalysts. Um, liquid phase fabrication, I'm sure many people here today are, are very aware of uh, sol gel processes and other, other processes used to, to generate nanomaterials uh, in, in liquid. These are, are very um, um, successful methods and can be used to generate large bulk um, uh, materials, but it can be tricky to change from one material to another and there's always um, leftover ligands and um, precursors in, in those solutions, which can be problematic. So the uh, other uh, methods are, are often um, investigated to, to come up, get around those problems. Uh, finally, py pyrolysis is another way of forming nanoparticles by um, forming droplets at, the, at a no nozzle uh, exit as solvent evaporates. Um, but this has the combination of you know, some chemical and mechanical challenges. So the technique that um, offers uh, another route to nanomaterials and which I'm going to come cover today is inert gas condensation or gas phase condensation formation of nanoparticles in vacuum. So the advantage of this technique is it gives really good control over the properties. It's a vacuum technique so it can involve um, a degree of investment in capital, but once that investment's been made, um, the running costs are relatively low. So let me move on to elaborate about that technique. So this is quite a complicated slide, so I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain how it works, but this schematic gives um, all the information really that you need to know about this technique and how we form nanomaterials um, using gas phase synthesis. The technique is based on a um, process called magnetron sputtering, which you may have come across for the deposition of thin films and two-dimensional structures. Um, so the starting materials, hopefully you can see my cursor, is a, a 
a solid source of, of usually metal or a metal oxide or, or metal uh, alloy. Um, this is highly pure material, so you can buy, uh, buy this from many suppliers with 99.99 or better purity. This, um, this target is, is loaded on a, what we call a magnetron, which is um, a um, this, uh, instrument here where you apply a voltage um, to this target. Um, and the whole um, equipment is encapsulated inside a vacuum chamber. Uh, and what we do is we enter a gas into the vacuum chamber and this gas forms a plasma um, in front of the target. And the plasma is energetic and those ions from the plasma effectively move around and knock atoms off this target. So what you effectively end up with is a vapor of metallic atoms inside this little mini chamber here. Um, and then as these atoms move through this region, which we call uh, the aggregation zone or nanoparticle generation zone, they come into contact with other nanoparticles, they have collisions with other atoms and other um, ions, and they lose energy and start to uh, coalesce or con condense. And so this region here we call the condensation zone, and this is where the nanoparticles are formed, where we move from individual atoms to clusters of atoms. Um, and then the properties of these clusters or nanoparticles as they grow and trans travel through this region depends on the parameters of this whole region, this whole zone here. And we can control that externally by changing things like the gas pressure, the power on the magnetron, the type of gas that we um, uh, enter into the, the chamber, the distance between this target here and the exit aperture, um, and, um, and the obviously the materials that we, um, we load as a target. So by changing all these parameters, we can control the properties of the nanoparticles that are generated in this zone. Now you'll notice here, the, there's an exit aperture at the bottom of this nanoparticle zone. So the nanoparticles are drawn through this chamber, through this exit no nozzle, and into a separate vacuum chamber, which we call the substrate or deposition chamber. Um, and at this point, as they exit this zone here, they're effectively, their properties are, are frozen. They, they've cooled and they've formed the, the kind of final structure. The nanoparticles then land onto the surface where we form a, um, a, a, a coating of nanoparticles, either a dispersed coating of individual nanoparticles or a three-dimensional nano coating where you have a, a built-up layer of highly porous material. One of the advantages of this technique is that although it's a plasma technique, and when you think about plasma techniques, you think of heat because effectively it's very hot inside this chamber. But because you've got these two separate areas, one area where you form the nanoparticles and then another zone where you deposit them, there is in fact actually no heat seen by the substrate. So we're able to coat very delicate substrates such as graphene um, and membranes without any damage on that surface. So it's incredibly um, powerful and very important in many applications. So using this technique by varying the parameters in this nanoparticle zone here, we're able to generate nanoparticles with a size range of a couple of atoms up to about 20 to 30 nanometers, which is a perfect sweet spot for, for catalysis. Um, but as I mentioned earlier in the talk, we also use this technique to generate our plasmonic materials um, for surface enhanced Raman. So there are many, many applications for the nanoparticles generated by this technique. Okay, so now I've explained a little bit about how it works. I'll keep referring back to that technique when I talk about the properties of the materials that we're generating. But let me just first show you some images of some typical um, nanoparticles that have been generated in our in our um, equipment. So first of all, um, the key property of this material is that they're ultra pure. Now you'll notice in that last slide, I explained all the different elements that we use to generate these materials. So you start with a very pure target, you use very pure process gases, and then you have your substrate, and that's it. There's nothing else, no chemicals, no precursors, no, um, no, other, no other solutions are needed in this process. So it really is ultra pure. So when you generate nanoparticles of gold or platinum or silver, you end up with just pure gold, platinum and silver on your surface. There's no ligands and no precursors left over. The other characteristic of these um, materials is that they are crystalline. So you can see the crystal um, lattice and individual atoms, in particular on this lovely picture of platinum. Um, so you can see that these are extremely pure and crystalline materials that we're generating. Another important uh, characteristic, which I know is an issue for chemically synthesized um, materials is that they're non-clumping, so they don't stick together. So they land on the surface and then they'll stay where they land. 
and you can see here you get this beautiful dispersed coating of nanoparticles and as you increase the deposition time that coating will build up but they still won't start sticking together and forming agglomerates so you get a really nice even coverage of non-agglomerated nanoparticles and one final point I'd like to make on, on this slide before I move on is that the process is repeatable. So all those parameters that we have um, for controlling the properties of the particles in the aggregation zones, the pressure, the gas flow, the power, we can return to those conditions and produce the same materials again. So it's highly repeatable, which is obviously incredibly important if you're producing, you're optimizing a process to produce a particular outcome, you want to be able to go back and produce those nanoparticles with those properties again. And that is, um, in fact, the case for this process. Okay, um, another further slide to reinforce the, the point where, that these nanomaterials are ultra pure. So we produced some nanoparticles of platinum and then sent um, them to um, away for uh, high resolution TEM um, images to be taken. And in this case, we used one image, uh, one set of nanoparticles, um, and looked at uh, the nanoparticles with three different collectors on the um, TEM. So in the bright field case, we were able to see nanoparticles with uh, very clear crystalline planes, as I showed on the previous slide, showing that they're crystalline in structure. Um, we then looked at the high angle diffraction image of those same nanoparticles, um, and we see very high contrast, as would be expected for a, a heavy element like, like platinum. But the really interesting comparison on this um, slide is actually the difference between the backscattered electron image and the bright field image. So the backscattered electrons uh, only give information about the surface um, of the structure. So what we're looking at here is the, 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 the atoms right on the surface of that platinum nanoparticle. And what you can see quite clearly is this crystal structure of the nanoparticle is the same at the surface as it is in the bulk of the nanoparticle through the bright field image. So what that is proving to us is that these nanoparticles really are very clean. There is no contamination or sulfur on the surface. And we see that through these high resolution TEM images uh, for platinum. So that's incredibly important. Okay, one of the other features of this particular technique is the control over density um, and loading. Um, because we use a, a vacuum technique, we're able to, to use um, a, an instrument called a quartz crystal microbalance. You may have come across this, it's, it's readily used in thin film deposition. It's a little um, gold quartered quartz crystal that sits inside a little vibrator. And effectively, it's, um, it measures the thickness or the weight of material that's deposited on it. Um, um, by um, monitoring the frequency of the vibration. So as the vibration, the frequency varies on the crystal, that tells you there's more weight on, this, on the surface. Um, and this is a technique that's used in, say, for thin films, but can also tell us the weight of um, nanomaterials that are deposited. So we actually have a little quartz crystal microbiome that sits next to our sample in the chamber while we're doing the deposition. So what this gives us is real-time information about the coating density on the surface. So it means that we can account for any changes in deposition rates, if there are any, and we can reproducibly um, create the same loading density from one sample to the next. So it can be used as monitoring, but also you can see here that we're able to control the density right from very mono-dispersed coatings, such as this first one on the left here, right through to 3D porous layers where you've got, you know, more like, um, a, you know, a bulk, bulk layer of nanoporous material. Um, and there are use cases for both, both um, extremes of this coating um, spectrum. But what's important in both cases that we, is that we have that control. And that's really important. And I'll come back to that later when I'm talking about one of the, the case studies. So before I move on and talk about the, the case studies, I just wanted to introduce um, the equipment that we sell uh, and produce at, at Nicolite so that I can talk in more detail about the particular equipment which was used in the projects. We have a range of different solutions for, for our researchers to generate their own nanomaterials in the lab from a, a benchtop system, which is ideal for first time users um, um, of vacuum technology. It's very easy to use and it has recipe control and it's great for depositing common metals um, and metal alloys. Um, we also have nanoparticle instruments, which can be attached to an existing vacuum chamber. Um, and this is actually the tool that I'll be talking about um, for the rest of the talk. 
Um, we also offer um, the capability to um, uh, develop a, a full vacuum system. So nanoparticles are extremely useful in lots of applications, but um, researchers may want to inc incorporate other techniques such as um, thin film deposition, or maybe even a system with some um, analysis tools, uh, which you could do with potentially one of our Nexus systems with a, a load lock and maybe a, a, a secondary chamber or, or, or um, um, load lock with an XPS or um, EDS or another technique on it. So just as a bit of a context to, 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 to what we do, those that's the range of, material, of, exper of um, equipment that we provide, but I will be focusing in this case on our NLUHV nanoparticle source, which was used for, for the projects um, on uh, electric catalysts that I'll present today. So here's a, a photograph of our, our lab setup here at Nicolite. So we're a very heavy R&D uh, focused company. So we do a lot of um, R&D for our own product development, but also for, for grant pod, uh, funded projects. So this is our, our little box system that we, we use for many of those uh, projects. So I mentioned that I'll be talking primarily about the NLU, NLUHV nanoparticle source. So that's this tool here on the top here. This is the source. So it is possible to put that on a, a vacuum system, um, another vacuum system. Um, the box chamber is just one that we, we happen to have in our own, um, our own lab. So if I can just sort of um, draw some parallels to the, to the slide I showed at the start, which is explaining the process and, and the chamber itself. So you've got your magnetron at the top here, which is where your, sorry, um, where your um, target is loaded. So you've got your 99.99% .99 pure material set at the top of that target. Um, you've then got your aggregation zone here, uh, where your nanoparticles are formed and your agglomeration um, takes place. Um, then we've got an instrument, which I haven't mentioned yet, which I will in, uh, talk about a bit more in a, in a few seconds, which is our quadrupole mass filter. So we do actually also offer the capability to do size selection and size measurements. Um, in flight uh, with our nanoparticle source, which is extremely important for, for controlling the size of nanoparticles and also studying the effect of nanoparticle size on the, the properties. So that sits right underneath the nanoparticle zone here um, on the chamber. And then the rest of the chamber, the rest of the box here is actually the sample chamber. So you can see the sample sits here at the bottom, at the bottom of the chamber here. And that's where the nanoparticles are deposited. So it's this chamber that um, the projects that I will present in a moment were, were, were carried out in. Um, so um, I'll be referring to this as I, I give the results for the, for the projects that we've been working on. So just a little bit more details about that um, last quadrupole. Um, so the instrument um, works on the principle of four magnetic poles, which run along the instrument. And as I said, it's an inline instrument. So the nanoparticles travel through the quadrupole before they hit the surface, uh, hit the substrate rather. And it's possible um, through um, changing the parameters on the electronics. So what we do is we, we change the DC and AC voltages and the frequency, we scan the frequency of the AC voltage. And as we do that, we effectively um, control the, the, um, the path uh, or the mass of nanoparticles, which will pass directly through the, the quadrupole. Um, nanoparticles with masses above or below that critical mass will be lost inside the instrument. So by scanning the, the frequency and the voltages, you are able to scan across the mass to charge ratio of these nanoparticles. And we translate that into a diameter by calibrating for the particular material. So in the two examples I've given here, we have um, uh, platinum nanoparticles. And in this case, you can see we've gone down to very small uh, masses and you can see individual atoms added to um, the nanoparticles um, and that that uh, is a very small uh, mass range um, of, of um, measurement. It's also possible to look up to much larger sizes up to 20 or 30 or you know even 100 um, nanometers and this plot for copper demonstrates that very well indeed. So with the copper um, nanoparticle plot what I've done here is show uh, three scans for copper nanoparticles generated with different conditions inside that nanoparticle zone so you, you remember at the start I talked about how you can control the properties by changing the gas flow or the power um, or the distance that the magnetron head sits above the aperture so by doing all those three things there you can see that this 
distribution, size distribution is shifted uh, from, you know, four nanometers for the smallest um, lengths, right up to, to 12 nanometers for the large 80 nanometers. So that's the kind of control that we have over the nanoparticle size. So these are measured plots. If we wished to deposit a sample with a, nanopart a copper nanoparticle size of say uh, four nanometers, what we would do with this instrument then is to drag the cursor on the software um, um, to the, the height of this um, peak here, and we would leave it there while it was depositing. So there's two different modes of operation, measurement and filtration, and both are extremely useful because there may be a case where you don't really want to filter nanoparticles because it does reduce the, the, the throughput because you're throwing away some of those nanoparticles obviously inside that uh, quadrupole. But you want to use it as a tool to set up the conditions. And that's often how we use this tool in the lab. It's for investigating what are the conditions we want. We want to be around 10 nanometers, for example. We don't mind if the distribution is as wide as this. We just want to have the peak about 10. So we can use this tool as, as, uh, as a means to optimizing the conditions. And because we're doing that, in situ as we're depositing. We don't have to wait for TEM analysis or SEM analysis. We can do it there and then, and then we can set the conditions and do the deposition. So it's really very powerful um, and a useful tool. And if you want to find out more about this, I put a link here to a paper from um, one of our customers in, in Leoben in Austria, who's just done a, um, a study and produced and, and published a paper. And this uh, compares the copper nanoparticles generated in flight with ex situ quantification. That's a really nice paper. If, uh, if you're interested, then, then, then visit that link and, and take a look. OK, so that's the mass filter. Now let me move on to alloy nanoparticles. So I haven't really talked much about the material, the source material, and what different materials we can use. So actually, there are several options for generating nanoparticles. We have two different magnetron heads, one with a single head, where you can load one target, and that can be an element or it can be an alloy. We also have this very um, exciting instrument called our, our three-headed DX3 source, whereby you have three separate targets. So you can play with the uh, combination of, uh, of those elements actually in inside the instrument without having to take the take the uh, magnetron out and load a different target. Uh, so both options, both the single head and the three head, can be used to form alloys. And in this case, I've given examples of results which were generated with both sources. So on the left hand side, there's some high entropy alloys, some nickel iron, moly cobalt chrome um, materials that was generated from an alloy target. On the right hand side, there's a nickel iron oxide uh, nanoparticles which were generated from individual targets. So both give options and routes towards um, forming alloys. Um, and there's reasons why you might want to go down either path. The three headed source gives you a lot more flexibility, but the two inch source, it's a bigger target, so you can put more power through it. So it's going to give higher deposition rates. So it's a bit of a trade off between which is um, most suitable, depending on what your primary requirement is for your um, application. So a little bit more information on the uh, DX3 and the three headed source. I wanted to just show some examples of um, materials which were generated using this particular instrument. So there's a couple of examples there, one being um, a um, silver decorated silicon nanoparticle. So this one is not um, not an alloy, but more like a kind of core shell structure, actually. So that something that's also possible with this particular instrument, you may not form an alloy, there may be some phase separation that goes on in the nanoparticle and forms a core shell. And in this case, you can see the buildup of silver, which is a very bright um, uh, material on this TEM image. As they increase uh, the loading, they start to form um, a, a, an incomplete shell on, on the silicon nanoparticle. And in the example below, this is a copper gold um, alloy that was formed um, using the, the uh, say, the three headed source. Uh, in this case, you can see there's EDX analysis as well as the, the high resolution TEM. And you can see the presence of copper and gold um, in this large nanoparticle here, showing that we do, in fact, have an alloy mix. Um, of copper and gold. And what I should mention, uh, I won't go into too much detail here, but I can certainly share papers and further information if anyone's interested. The alloys um, and core shell structures that are formed using this technique do not follow 
the bulk phase diagrams. Because we're at the nanoscale, particularly when you go to the small sizes, much less than 10 nanometers, the surface energy really drives those um, uh, stable and uh, low energy states for those nanoparticles. So you get all sorts of interesting structures that you may not be able to generate in the bulk. Um, so you also get changes in with core shell structures. You can get the, the core and the shell reversed um, for different size structures, depending on the dominance of that surface energy. So it's a really fascinating um, field to work in um, and can be quite challenging to form the structures that, that, you, that you wish to, to form. But this particular instrument does open up a whole range of materials which may not be possible through through other means may not be through chemical means or other physical means all because you're working at this small size and you're forming structures that are driven by surface energy and thermodynamics inside that aggregation zone so it's a, a really interesting but very complex area and, and fascinating to, to explore okay so um, before I move on to the particular case studies, I just wanted to do a review of and a bit of a um, summary of the advantages of these materials generated by gas-based synthesis for generating catalysts. So I've already mentioned a few of these already, but I just want to talk about them specifically for catalysts in this phase. So the process is very flexible. Um, one thing that uh, might consider with the um, equipment is that once you have the equipment, there's that initial outlay to buy it, but once you have it, then all you have to do is change the target to look at different materials. We always use argon, helium, maybe oxygen as process gases, so those are standard, but it's very easy to, to develop um, or to, to, to start developing new processes for, for, for complex structures. And I've mentioned with the three-headed source that it's also um, easy to, to ex explore alloys and protect potentially structures that aren't accessible by other means. The nanoparticles are non-agglomerated, so that's really important for catalysis that return that surface energy, surface area, so that catalytic area, that active area is, is returned and available for reactions and isn't lost in an agglomerate of, um, of, of, of material. The ultra pure um, nature of the material is also really important because the surface is, is pure, pure metal. It's not um, coated by any other um, surfactants or other chemicals. So that's, again, we see um, highly reactive material, not only for catalysis, but other applications as well. Another feature which is important for this, for this technique and advantageous for developing catal catalysts is that this is a single step process. So the change of all of the, although I mentioned it and I, looked, I showed how the particles are formed, as a user, this is a one-step process. You set one set of conditions, you set those up and you press go, and that will de deposit the samples onto your surface. And you don't need to do anything else to them. You don't need to do any drying steps, any calcination steps, any purification steps. They're just ready, ready to use. Um, accurate loading is another advantage um, of this technique. I know it can be quite tricky to ascertain the loading of catalyst, catalysts in things like catalyst coated membranes. We're able to measure this in situ, so we know exactly how much material has been put down on the surface. That's incredibly important, especially when you're trying to reduce loading um, of expensive catalysts. Um, other advantages are no chem chemical waste. We don't use any chemicals, so there's no aqueous or, or, or gaseous waste stream to consider. Um, the only waste is um, the metal target. There will be some left over. You can't use up the entire um, sputter target, but these are very straightforward to recycle, and most companies will take them back and actually pay you for that material. So it is a very uh, a green process um, and uh, has um, yeah very little waste. And the final point is that it's scalable. Um, so the equipment we that uh, we sell and we work with is is research scale. So the sizes are modest um, and the deposition rates are modest, but it is possible to scale it up. And in fact, um, coatings like these, uh, certainly in thin film technology, are used readily and um, quite extensively in lots of um, mass manufacturing processes. Uh, so that's a, a route to scale up that is all, already exists um, and can be can be accessed for, for scaling up um, generation of catalysts. Okay, so let's move on to some uh, some projects and some data. So the first one I mentioned um, that I'll be talking about electric catalysts for um, water electrolysis for generating green hydrogen. So the first one is high entropy alloy nanoparticle catalysts. 
So just a little bit of background. Um, I don't really need to, uh, to tell you this as you know, pretty well um, established that obviously we're, everyone's moving towards a, a net zero uh, target by 2050. Uh, green hydrogen has been touted as one of the um, significant contributions uh, to, to lowering our, our carbon footprint. Um, and green hydrogen, as opposed to blue or grey hydrogen, which is, is currently used, um, has to be, you know, is produced by water splitting using renewable energy. So obviously relies on other sources of renewable energy, but is in itself a, a, a very promising and important um, technology to, to achieving that net zero target. So green hydrogen has its place um, in the sort of grand scheme of um, reducing our carbon footprint, and in particular in used in, in chemical production. Um, so things like producing ammonia and fertilizers and also steel production. So actually thinking about hydrogen cars, maybe not quite so clear on whether that's going to be a game changer or not, or whether electric cars are going to be the, the, the more um, key, key player in that area. But certainly where it comes to chemical production and aviation and you know, um, shipping, hydrogen has a huge role to, part, to play um, in that, in bringing down our reliance on fossil fuels. However, there are several barriers um, to the adoption of green hydrogen, and I'm not going to go into those in detail. Infrastructure, storage and transport uh, are, are some of those. But the particular area which is pertinent to, to, to the projects that we've been working on is the cost of that uh, producing green hydrogen and also the capacity. So catalysts fall very nicely into to, to that remit. So the project um, was con 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 try con conceived um, with, with Oxford University with Rob Earthworks Group um, and was funded by a Henry Royce um, uh, MCAP um, project um, call. So what we wanted to look at was the replacement of um, iridium in the oxygen evolution reaction uh, for water splitting. So high entropy alloys are uh, yeah, been touted as a a cheap and um, abund earth abundant alternative to, to iridium. So they seem like, a, you know, it's worth exploring um, these materials for the OER reaction. Um, and the other advantage, obviously, is that we have this, you know, three headed source for looking at, um, at uh, high entropy alloys. So looking at five or more elements with a source where you can, you can load um, individual elements is, is highly attractive. But actually, in the first case, uh, what we wanted to look at was just whether we could produce um, catalytically active material using these alloys. So actually, for this project, we, we used an alloy target in this first part of the experiments, um, and we were looking at the deposition rates um, and uh, obtaining um, reasonable depo deposition rates, which would be useful for using in real life loadings of, um, of catalyst coated membranes. So the two the elements that we looked at were nickeline, cobalt, moly, chromium, and aluminium. So there's two different alloys that are present. In this first case, it's nickeline, cobalt, chrome, moly alloy, uh, and these were generated in our um, NLUHV using the two-inch target. Um, so you can see these materials here. There were different size nanoparticles generated, and these were generated by changing the conditions inside the nanoparticle zone. So we had four nanometer nanoparticles and five to eight nanometer particles and these were deposited on TEM grids for TEM analysis such as these images here, um, silicon for, for the um, x-ray analysis and also glossy carbon disks for the electrochemical measurements um, and these images were, were kindly taken by um, the team at, at Oxford. Um, very similar images for the nickel iron, moly, cobalt, aluminium um, alloys, also generated in the same way. And again, we had um, two different size of nanoparticles, which were generated in these experiments, four nanometers and the five to eight nanometers. And what you'll notice, actually, if you look at both, um, I'll just quickly flick back. Um, if you look at the middle slide, middle, middle image on both um, slides, you can see that we're forming chains um, of uh, nanoparticles. So the little dipoles, are, the magnetic dipoles are, are aligning. This is quite common for these sorts of magnetic materials, um, but, uh, but isn't a, necessarily a problem, but it's a, an interesting thing to note. Okay, so let's move on to the x-ray analysis. So in the first instance, we had the question that we know we've generated these materials, we've deposited and generated nanoparticles from these targets, but what is the composition? How do we know whether we've generated an alloy? 
um, have we generated individual nanoparticles of each constituent element? And that's something that you can't know um, from the uh, TEM. So we looked at uh, X-ray photo emission spectroscopy of these uh, structures. In fact, this was data that was uh, taken by Leanne Jones at Oxford. Um, and we looked at the, the valence band edge um, for these materials. So you can see in the first two graphs, we're looking at um, the valence band, band edge for all constituent elements and the alloy. So the alloy is the green one. Um, and we've got cobalt, iron and nickel on there as well. And for both, both different alloys, we can see the, the differences from the elemental to the alloy band edge. And what we're seeing is, that, is a difference there. We are seeing a shift. Um, so it does look like um, this... Um, um, XPS curve doesn't look like any of the elements. So we've got something that looks like it could be an alloy, but it doesn't tell us what we have. We also see a difference between the moly and the chrome, which is encouraging. So it's not being dominated by the common elements of nickel, iron and cobalt. So again, points to the fact that we have made changes to the structure of this material, uh, which is, you know, which is very positive. So the next step was to look at um, high resolution uh, EDS um, and I've plotted here for the nickel iron moly uh, cobalt chromium sample an EDS map of the nanoparticles. So in this case, you can see the elemental distribution for iron, nickel, chromium, um, cobalt um, and moly. Um, and in this image, it's quite clear that we have all those all five elements are present in the nanoparticles. I mean, it's a, not a massively high resolution image, but it's pretty conclusive. So this is our first real conclusive evidence that we have generated an alloy and not just a mix of elemental nanoparticles. So it's really, really positive. And we are um, hoping to do some more high, higher resolution EDS to look at individual nanoparticles um, and the distribution. Because again, we still, we still can't be quite clear how those different elements sit on those structures, whether there is any kind of coarse shell formation or whether it is a, uh, an evenly di distributed alloy. So those are still open questions. Moving on to the electrochemical measurements. So the little glassy uh, carbon coated electrodes were put in a, um, a little um, half cell um, in, in the lab at Oxford. Uh, and we did some CVs um, for the alloys and also for, for nickel nanoparticles as, a, as a, a benchmark, just to see how they compared. And what was really nice to see that for all, all cases, for both alloys with aluminum and chromium, we do see that oxygen evolution um, peak, which is great. And also we see differences. So the um, uh, the potential, the um, over potentials are slightly different, but not um, not massively different. But there are differences between the uh, elemental and the alloys, which is which is encourage encouraging. So what we can say from that is conclusively that if it's not just the nickel that's active here, we do know that nickel is is a is a good uh, catalyst for this reaction. But it's nice to see that the other elements are playing a part. Um, in this reaction. The over potentials also are, are, are good. They're not too high. So that is not too many um, losses in the, in the cell. Um, and uh, the tuffle plots for these particular reactions um, show uh, the tuffle slopes are a bit higher than the nickel, which is perhaps not surprising given this is the first, um, first try at these materials, but they're not, not terrible. Um, but the other thing to note um, is the difference in size. So it could be that actually the, the difference um, in the tuffle slope is, is partly attributed to a difference in the active surface area of the nanoparticles. So although this um, was uh, normalized according to the surface area of the um, electrode, it could be that the actual active areas are different. So it's not completely clear if these, these figures are, 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 are representative of the material. But certainly they're very encouraging um, and lead us to, to believe that it's worth investigating these materials further. So that's very good. Um, <clears throat> and finally, we looked at the pilot polarization curves for um, the, the two different alloys. So on the left hand side, the chromium alloy and on the right hand side, the aluminium alloy. And in this case, it was interesting to compare the performance of different size nanoparticles. So it, in this case, we're looking at the same material, but different size um, nanoparticles in the catalyst. And in both cases, we see that the smaller nanoparticles are actually more active. 
Um, so this is, you know, again, an interesting result could be due to um, difference in surface area, but it may be that there's actually a difference in structure. I mentioned earlier that we see difference in the compositional structure for different sizes. So I, we know from experience with other materials that when you move from, sort of, from about 10 down to um, five or six or even smaller nanometers, you can see difference in those structures. So it could be down to the structural differences. But certainly it's interesting, we see the same trend for both materials. Um, and in both cases, the over potentials are, are very encouraging. Um, and uh, we'd like to do some more work to explore further um, the effects of different alloy compositions. So in this case, we've only looked at uh, one different, um, uh, two different alloys, and we'd like to look at a few, few further, but it's yeah, very encouraging work and a good place to, to start um, looking at these materials. Okay, um, so I'd just like to move on to the to the second um, case study. So for the second case study, we were looking at nickel iron oxide catalyst loaded um, um, and iron exchange membranes for water electrolysis. So the reasoning behind this project is slightly different um, to the first project. So this is a, a kind of follow on from our first voice funded project. Um, and what one of the uh, issues that we were looking to address is that it's actually uh, that there's a demand for these new catalysts um, for OER catalysts to replace iridium, but actually developing new catalysts can be quite slow and complex. Um, chemical synthesis can take a while to develop new protocols, but not only that, it's inconsistency between lab based and more industrial testing can also lead to confusion um, when developing new um, catalysts. So the aims of this particular project were, were, were several fold. One was to develop new lab based screening techniques and benchmark these against um, industrial protocols so that the lab based um, protocols could be used to look through a raft of different materials and identify promising materials for further development. This would be done um, at Oxford University using their um, equipment. They have, in fact, do have a, a nanoparticle source from Nicolite. Um, and we would use this uh, project to develop the um, different uh, electrocatalysts using that, that instrument. So part of the project was to develop catalysts for um, AEM um, devices, but also to develop these protocols for benchmarking. So it's a kind of a two strand um, process. So I, I did put on here that I, I won't be talking about those protocols um, and they, that testing that was well, carried out by Leanne Jones. I'm sure at some point she will be sharing those results, but I'll be focusing only on on the project, the parts of the project um, which were carried out by Nicolai. And apologies, my animation is not working um, because I'm not in presenter mode. So the two parts that I'll be talking about today are the demonstration of gas phase synthesis produced transition metal catalysts for AEM. Uh, and the demonstration of the scalability of that technique. Okay, there we go. Oh, that didn't work. So the first step um, for this project was to actually demonstrate that we could generate these materials on a catalyst coated membrane and, um, and get some results in a, in a simple cell. So here's some pictures of, of the membranes that were coated at Nicolite. So these are Femacep um, membranes um, purchased um, from fuel cell, cell store, uh, we deposited uh, one milligram per centimeter squared of nickel uh, iron oxide nanoparticles. Now, I thought it was worth spending some time explaining how we did the coatings, because I know this is um, probably a foreign kind of concept um, if, if your background is chemical synthesis. So in, in our um, in gas phase synthesis, the way that you coat a particular area is to use what we call a physical mask. So on this uh, picture on the left hand side, you can see the physical mask with a hole cut out. So that's the um, five centimeter squared area where we want the catalyst coated, coated membrane. So that goes into the chamber and we coat on top of that, um, that mask. Then once the coating has been deposited, we take it out of the chamber, we remove the mask and what you see is this really neatly defined area coated with the, mem with the catalyst. Um, and finally, you can see the catalyst ready for assembly. So these nanoparticles again were generated from a two inch uh, nickel iron um, target. And in this case, to generate the oxide, we introduced oxygen into the aggregation zone. So we oxidize the nanoparticles in vacuum so that we produce an oxide um, um, on the surface. 
The loading was calculated again during the court, using a quartz crystal microbalance so that we are very confident that we do actually have one milligram per centimeter squared loading. We don't need to measure it after we've deposited. We were able to control that during the process. Um, and the deposition rates were um, around 300 nanograms per centimeter squared per second. So for this one milligram per centimeter squared loading, um, that was achieved in, in under an hour, just to give a, a, an idea of scale up. Um, and this isn't the, the, you know, the fastest method. This is a two inch megatron. There are ways of making this um, faster using a, a larger megatron or potentially um, using a, um, a complex system where you'd have a, a load lock so you wouldn't need to vent uh, the chamber and change samples. So there's lots of ways of making this process more efficient. But what it shows is that it is possible to get realistic loadings using this technique. And the final point I wanted to mention, because this was something that was of concern to us during the experiment, was that these um, fumin, fumin set membranes um, are known to shrink and expand and very sensitive to moisture. So there was a worry that when we put the membrane in the vacuum chamber, that it would shrink um, and then the, the size would change, which is obviously very important for making the, the cell, that all the dimensions remain consistent. And what we noticed that there was absolutely no shrinkage in our system. Um, we didn't do any cleaning to the membrane before it was loaded and it came out with exactly the same size as it went in. So that was a, um, a good result and important result for, for you know, potential scale up of this technology for, for, for bus manufacturing of these membranes. Okay, so these catalyst coated membranes were then sent up to um, our partner uh, in Manchester Metropolitan University. So. Uh, Thomas uh, Greenwood uh, did the measurements for us, so I've, I've put some details of the uh, protocol here. I'm certainly not an expert in this area, so um, I hope it um, makes makes sense. And if you want any more details, it's probably best to speak to, speak to, to the team at Manchester Met. So it was a one mole KOH solution um, with a, a, a stainless steel um, PTL. Uh, the cathode was dry, um, but um, we used 100 mil, or we used 100 mil per minute flow rate, and at 60. Uh, degree C. Um, that temperature was optimized. We'd looked at other temperatures, but 60 degree was um, used as the optimum for this particular um, measurement. So the plot and um, polarization curve that's plotted here was measured after a, a 12 hour hold at one amp per centimeter squared and a 30 minutes open circuit voltage hold. Um, and what we did see during those that um, that cycling was that the performance did improve um, and the resistance of the cell did come down, but then was stable after that point. So this plot here shown um, on the slide was that the um, stable state of the cell. So what we noticed from this data is that there's very good performance to the cell. Um, the over potential is consistent with literature and uh, is low, so that shows um, um, a good um, activation um, potential uh, to the reaction. And also the you know the resistance of the cell looks looks reasonable. Um, it's not obvious that there's um, excessive losses in the cell, so we were pleased uh, with the performance um, of the, the catalyst coated membrane in this material. However, when we looked at the cell after it came out of um, or a little the membrane as it came out of the cell, what we did notice actually was that there was some delamination of the material um, after it had been through the cycling. So this will have lost, um, contributed to, uh, to omic losses in the device. Um, what we know from our experiment is that we soft landed the nanoparticles onto the surface. So um, we didn't try to improve the adhesion. There are techniques for improving adhesion of uh, nanomaterials onto surfaces and we're, we are aware of these, but we chose not to, to use them in this case in our first experiment. Um, that can involve surface treatment, but also gentle acceleration of nanoparticles. So the nanoparticles actually can be driven with slightly higher energy than the soft landed. So soft landed are only a few EV. We can increase that energy in a controlled manner, and that can be done to help adhesion. So there are experiments that we would like to perform um, in future work to, to help with the adhesion of that layer um, to reduce the, the delamination of the coating. Um, and then the other um, follow on from this particular project is we'd like to look at other compositions of, of alloys with the three headed source. So um, move away from the two inch source to really open up that catalyst discovery um, element of the project um, and look at lots of different um, nanoparticle compositions um, with a view to perhaps working um, on one particular promising um, alloy composition and moving forward with testing on that. 
So I think i um, just reached my conclusion. So I've presented to you today a, a process, a one-step process called gas-based synthesis for generating nanoparticle catalysts. And I've shown some of the properties of those materials, how they are not agglomerated and ultra pure, um, and how they are, are suitable for use um, for, for, for catalysis. Um, I've explained how this is a flexible process um, and that there's no chemical waste. And finally, um, I presented some very early results on two particular projects um, for um, electrocatalysts for oxy ox oxygen evolution reaction. Firstly, high entropy alloy nanoparticles, and secondly, nickel iron oxide nanoparticles. And what I'd like to say about both projects is that these are early results, but they look extremely promising and certainly warrant further study, um, which is what we will be doing in, in the coming months. And finally, I'd just like to thank our contributors at Oxford, Manchester Met, NPL, and Nicolite, um, who uh, worked on these projects. Uh, and thank you very much. And I'm sorry, uh, we've got to the end of the hour already. Thank you very much. Sorry, my video won't start. <laughs> the joys of Zoom. Okay, there we go. Um, thank you very much for an excellent talk. Uh, Vicky, um, we've had quite a few questions come in while you've been chatting. You have I know, to I just can see those. Yes, yes, that's fine. I haven't yeah. seen these yet. Sorry, I was ignoring them while I was speaking. Okay, oh, no, so no, I'll of just... course. So the first one I'll is just, how expensive um... are your systems? Right. Okay, so that that it varies. Um, so from the uh, the the instruments, um, so the NLUHV, which can sit on its own system, um, they start at about um, uh, thirty thousand. Um, but then depend on the on the you know which options you use and how many other parts like pumps and power supplies are supplied. The little benchtop NL50 um, instrument is sixty five thousand, and then the full systems again really depends on what you put on them. But then we're talking you know one hundred and fifty thousand plus. So there's a full range of instruments there. I should mention also that we 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 offer I say research services, so we can try. Um, doing some depositions in house, um, if you wanted to have a go and see how materials are performed, um, so you don't necessarily have to, um, you know, invest in equipment as the first first step. So I hope that answers your question. Um, the second question was, what is the difference between LL NL dash UHV system and DC, DC sputtering? Right, so the difference between sputtering and our technique is effectively you start with sputtering, but because you uh, confine the vapour that's the sputter vapour into a, an additional chamber, so the NLUHB, the aggregation is effectively like an additional chamber, which increases the pressure around that metal vapour. Um, because it's under that high pressure, it undergoes collisions and forms those nanoparticles. So in sputtering, that metal vapour will um, expand and, and hit the surface or hit your substrate. Whereas we, we introduce this second step whereby that, that vapour is confined um, and must, you know, it's basically forced to form nanoparticles. So you've formed a 3D structure before it lands on the surface. Other than that, it's, it is quite similar, um, and we often use that as a comparison. But, I mean, it is possible to form nanomaterials from sputtering, but the control is, is pretty poor, and it's very difficult to separate things like the loading density from the size, because you're effectively um, uh, relying on the material, you know, the, the sputter material moving on the surface, and it's very difficult to control that. So, um, by our method, you can generate controlled nanoparticles with controlled size and, and composition. Excellent. Uh, so, yeah, are the nanoparticles produced in the system of slide 10 freestanding or supported? And if so, what so, support? Okay, so that, yes, they are supported. This technique is, is ideally suited to deposition onto a surface. It is potentially possible to scrape them off and collect them, but it seems slightly counterintuitive to do that when there are other techniques that work better for, for, for freestanding nanoparticles. So yes, they are supported. And in terms of substrates, it can be coated on anything, anything that can go in a vacuum chamber. So carbon, um, oxide services, you know, silicon, we've coated, as I mentioned membranes, graphene, um, we've coated plastics, we've coated um, paper, uh, pretty much anything, really. Um, but yeah, with, with standard vacuum, uh, works. Okay, so the next question was, how homogenous are the alloys like nickel, iron oxide? Does it contain a that's, mix of nickel oxide and iron oxide as well? That's a very, that's a very good question. And in fact, actually, that is a question we have. So the best evidence we have is that EDS map 
um, which showed that we have, sorry, no, that was the different, I'm talking about the wrong materials here, aren't they? Sorry, the nickel oxide, we actually, I haven't actually seen any, um, any TEM of these materials. So that's a very good question. We don't know um, until we do further analysis. So without looking at the um, uh, X-ray analysis or the EDX, it's, it's hard to know. Um, so I'm not sure. It, potentially we do have both of those elements present. The next question is, are there any limitations on what can be used as a target? Um, yes, the only limitations are that the target needs to be conducting or at least semiconducting. So um, for the NL50, there is a DC power supply on the system. So that does require fully conducting target materials. So metals or metal alloys. So you couldn't put an oxide target in, for example. However, on the NLUHV instrument, which is much more flexible, it is possible to use a range of different power supplies. And we, we use um, um, a pulse DC power supply, which is kind of an in between um, DC and RS sputtering. Um, and those you can generate uh, materials from um, semiconducting materials. So we've generated silicon, carbon, um, um, yeah, lots of lots of other sort of low conductivity materials, but it's not possible to use insulating targets. That that just wouldn't work. So that's why when uh, I presented the work on the nickel iron oxide, we started with a conducting uh, alloy target and then used oxygen inside the nanoparticle zone to form the oxides. So it, it, it's a slightly different approach. So it's a little bit different to sputtering, where you definitely can form. Um, thin films from insulating materials. It's a bit more tricky with uh, nanoparticles. Um, the next question, sorry, my window's closed, um, is when, when you use this technique to prepare electrodes for green hydrogen production, how are the hydrogen production rates? Is it higher or lower? compared to conventional electrochemical reactions using a power converted catalyst. I'm assuming that's powder catalyst. Yes, I see that is. Um, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid I can't answer that one. I don't know the answer to that one. We haven't done that experiment. It's a very good question. Um, and I'm sorry, <laughs> I would imagine um, it would be lower because this is very, this is, this is new technology and it hasn't been fully optimized, but I, I, I Yes, I don't know. We we haven't done that test, um, so I don't know. I'm afraid. Sorry, sorry to <laughs> sorry to not be able to give you an answer, but uh, um, I haven't I haven't looked at that. So uh, thanks for an interesting talk. How would you rate the efficiency and stability of these nanoparticles for different reactions environments, e.g., pH? Um, that's a good question. Um, you yes, I don't know. Actually, that's a, I would like to know that myself. Actually. Um, I think one of the things I suppose you have to be mindful of is the fact that these, because these are pure materials, they 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 may be, you know, they are very reactive. So they potentially could be more susceptible to, um, you know, reaction with environments, you know, so different acidic and uh, alkali environments. Um, but actually, I, I, I'm not. It's not an experiment we've done. I'm afraid that, you know, we're material scientists, so we don't do any of these experiments ourselves. We rely on partners to help us. So I, I don't have a good answer for that. But I, I do wonder whether they would be slightly more sensitive um, than uh, powder catalysts. Um, for our CCM. So for the CCM, that's a good question, and I'm afraid I'd have to refer that to our partners. I'm afraid I, don't, I can't remember what the current collector is for that one. Um, so, Vicky, you're based on the Harwell campus. No, no, we're um, up at um, Upper Hayford. We're in the um, Hayford. Upper Hayford uh, in, in the Innovation Centre up in uh, Upper, Hay Upper Hayford near, near Bicester. Um, why are you so um, so why did the, we select these materials? Um, we selected these materials because actually because they were available. <laughs> so, so actually getting hold of these materials as targets um, can be tricky. So we had a look at a few different events. So these ones were available. Also because we've had a lot of experience working with nickel, iron and cobalt and moly and aluminium and chromium before in elemental um, forms. So we have experience with those particular metals. But yes, actually also because they were available. Um, so in terms of changing the proportions, um, that's a really interesting idea. Um, we'd, like to, we'd like to know what will be the effect that we would expect there to be, to be, there to be an effect, um, but I'm not sure what it would be. Um, that's, 
uh, yeah, sorry, that's not a very good answer, I'm afraid, but I, I haven't really considered um, other, other structures yet beyond what we've looked at already. And, and what is the highest single atom coverage that your system is capable of, of achieving? Highest single atom coverage? Um, is that in terms of loading? Um, how much material? Uh, so we, well, again, it's all of time things. So what we look at in terms of, you know, thickness and coating is what's reasonable. Um, so we really want to be looking at deposition rate, deposition times of a few hours, not days. So certainly milligrams, or we can get, I showed you milligram coatings before. Um, we could potentially go up to, um, yeah, a few tens or hundreds of milligrams, but not gram levels. I think that's probably too, too high for this technique. I suggest we go through the last couple of questions and then that's it. So yes, I mean, that's very right. That's okay. Um, thank right, you for so bearing with us, those that are still online. Sorry, everybody. Yes, it's been a, been a long afternoon. What would happen if we use CO2 instead of argon or helium? Ah, okay, that's interesting. CO2, I think, I don't think we've ever used it. We've used methane, uh, definitely done, um, never used CO2. So methane in the aggregation zone, we did do, and that, um, that is possible. You have to always be mindful of handling uh, different gases. CO2, um, yeah, I assume you'd be able to form some kind of carbonate structure. I can't think of that. I don't think off the top of the head we've ever tried it. We've used, yeah, helium argon and methane definitely. Um, and that has given us I mean, some, some interesting structures. Um, CO2 is fairly hard to react. So a different carbon source might be better if you want in carbonate materials. Mm. Yeah, um, it's not something we've tried, I have to say. Yeah, um, yeah. But it might be yeah. worth a try, because if you can, you can solve <laughs> a lot of problems. Yeah, that's uh, uh, interesting. So, have you done any electrochemical surface area testing? How does the active area of the coating compare to traditional coatings for oxygen evolution? Um, we haven't done that, um, no, so that's a good question. Um, we had lots of conversations about the surface area and how to calculate it and how to normalise for it. So, um, no, we haven't done that, but actually that would be a good idea. And is there an upper limit for loading in weight percent? Um, so, do you mean in terms of the loading overall? Um, or so I think I kind of maybe answered that already in terms of how much we can we can certainly get into milligrams, tens, um, tens maybe, uh, yeah, tens of milligrams, maybe hundreds, but not much beyond that. Presumably, the more you put on, the less sort of the thicker the coating, it's, but the less you get the benefit of the nanoparticle. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, most of the, the applications we look at, we're trying to reduce loading. So we're not trying to get the most loading possible. We're trying to bring that down. Um, so typically we, we, we work in the nanogram rate, rate regime, um, maybe up to milligrams. So we're not, we haven't been really trying to look at, at higher loadings than that, um, because that's not really, um, yeah, that's a lot of material um, and we're looking at very precious material and precious metals are often which you don't want to be using more than you know mic micrograms or uh, nanograms anyway um so what are the disadvantages of gas phase synthesis yes obviously there's the outlay for the equipment which i mentioned but then running costs are actually fairly low it can the targets can be a problem obviously you know we all know about the cost of iridium um some of the other materials let's say we do a lot of work with gold and silver and so silver's quite cheap gold again we have challenges in our other projects of trying to drive down those costs um other than that um it's yeah scalability uh, it can be scaled but certainly if you compare it with you know techniques that can generate grams per minute I mean, we're never going to reach that kind of level um so mostly it's it's, it's a cost i think um is, is the is the sort of um can be the stumbling block at the start uh, but once that's you know you get over that it's it's um it's relatively cheap So uh, the last, very last question I snuck in was uh, gas phase synthesis can get porous materials, but how are you measuring it? I'm assuming if you've not done surface area, you've not done BT. No, we have done some, we have done surface area measurements on other materials a long, long time ago. And I can't, I'm trying to remember now what, what that was. Um, we haven't done it for a while. Um, we tend to just look, yeah, in terms of porosity, we're looking at quite qualitative um, 
sort of results looking at the you know TEM structures cross sections in SEM so not strictly measuring the porosity or the surface area so I'm afraid I haven't got a lot a good feel for that but certainly we know by looking at the color of the material so we've done experiments where we've done different porosity so we've accelerated the nanoparticles to reduce the porosity and then you can see a range of different structures and different colors but again that's quite a quantitative way of you know um sorry qualitative way of looking at it rather than a quantitative way well thank okay. you very very much for giving us more of your time than you agreed to and giving us an <laughs> talk. very sorry um, about the technical problems Part of modern life, isn't it? Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs> An excellent and very fascinating talk.